This place is meant to be in charge. But with five prime ministers in six years, it hasn't felt that way. The whole operation number 10 was utterly broken down. What's the answer? We became a laughingstock of the world. An utter catastrophic disaster. In this series, we're trying to work out what happened to our political system. I think we lost our minds. I don't know a single MP who didn't get a death threat. The party that likes to believe it's born to rule has indulged in an epic drama with no lasting heroes. I have been a systematic plotter who's tried to remove the Prime Minister. You are not children in the playground. You are legislators. I'm Laura Kunzberg, and I was the BBC's political editor for nearly seven years. It was my job to make sense of what on earth was going on, or at least to try, as we all lived through a norm-busting, convention-defying moment of history. Was Theresa May a good Prime Minister? No. I think she was a good Prime Minister, yes. I think she was dealt an impossible hand, but then played it badly. In this episode, not one, but two Prime Ministers removed from office as Britain battles with the biggest challenge in a generation. Do we have a plan for Brexit? We do. He's gone. <gasps> he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. Thank you very much. Months in the making, working with insiders who've never spoken publicly before. We go behind the scenes to Westminster's real cast list. The civil servants, the ministers, and the advisers now free to speak. I'm done with slagging I know you're, May, I, so I know you I'm don't not, want to be personal. I'm not really I, into the, I'm very happy to be personal about Boris. <laughs> Just how close did our political system come to falling apart? There was no plan. And will it ever be the same again? It is the end of normal. And so we begin. The country has voted to leave the EU. It's Friday the 24th of June. The people of Britain have voted to leave the European Union in an historic move that has stunned the rest of the continent and sent the pound plunging on the international markets. One of my children came very quietly up the stairs when he'd woken up before going to school and said, Daddy, 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 we've won. Got woken up by one of my kids to say, you know, it looks like it's gone the wrong way. The greatest change to the British states in a generation. Uncertainty, the greatest force at play. Politicians, whatever side they were on, had little clue about what would come next. I seem to remember it was a really nice sunny day and I just went for a run on Wimbledon Common. I remember people stopped me and said, what happens now, Justine? And I, I was saying to them, I don't, I don't know. I had no idea what was coming. But at that, in that moment, it felt an enormous thing that we'd, we'd won. We were going to leave the EU. I remember being on College Green, opposite Parliament, giving interviews, blazing sunshine, but really thinking, what on earth is going to happen now? My first reaction is, we're about to lose a really good prime minister who had a few more years in him, and we don't know now who is going to come after that. D -D -U, D -D -U. Leavers were jubilant, but despite remnants of cheap white wine the next morning, no celebrations among the Conservatives' Brexit cheerleaders. Johnson and Gove appeared um, blinking into the headlights, uh, flustered, bewildered, scared. Oh, my God, what have we done? We didn't really mean to do this. These were not genuine Brexiteers. There's no way that they were. Ben Gascoigne has been at Boris Johnson's side for years. He's never publicly spoken about that work before. I didn't see Boris at any stage jubilant. Um, he was very pensive throughout and, to some extent, subdued. He became increasingly aware of the role and responsibility he now had. I think he was more nervous than scared. 
Across this place, Whitehall, it was a sense of disbelief. If you'd been listening at all, the result was not a surprise, but the civil service had not expected or prepared for it. It was like suddenly we had this mountain to climb and the whole thing was shrouded in mist and we didn't know what we had to do, how we were going to do it. We were confronted with this enormous challenge of dealing with something that was unprecedented. There was no plan. The main feeling in the Foreign Office building was of mourning. People were in tears. Uh, people were in shock. I walked around the Foreign Office corridors and people were devastated. You know, there were civil servants in floods of tears, uh, people hugging each other. There was an overall really downbeat mood. Helen McNamara has worked across government through the wildest of times. Rising to become Deputy Cabinet Secretary, she was in the room when the biggest political decisions were taken by those at the top. She's never spoken publicly before. Did it feel like there was a plan? No. No. Which is understandable. I mean, it's a hell of a question. But I don't think institutionally Whitehall was ready. Of course we weren't. I mean, we weren't ready at all. And whose fault was that, that Whitehall wasn't ready? I think it's impossible to be ready. There might not have been a plan for what would happen after the referendum and paranoia soon filled the vacuum. Brexiteers feared civil servants in powerful government departments would stymie the UK's exit. The Treasury is a very powerful department from the Chancellor down. The Treasury never wanted to leave, didn't like the result and tried to obstruct it. The Treasury's behaviour during this period was um, anti-democratic, deeply unsatisfactory. The Treasury throughout that period was often accused of trying to block Brexit. The Treasury was trying to go for a soft, not proper Brexit, or Brexit in name only. What do you say to those accusations? Yeah, I mean, the Treasury was accused of all sorts of things. I was accused of all sorts of things. I mean, the Treasury was certainly trying to go for a soft Brexit. Um, and, and I don't think we should apologise for that at all. One of the things that made me spit then and makes me furious even now was these accusations that the civil service was somehow trying to stop Brexit happening. I mean, I worked for a department, by the time I left, there was about 700 of us, dedicated public servants who were doing that job to deliver what ministers wanted. But, like I had never seen before, others in Whitehall were open about their fears of Brexit. So I was by no means the only Brexiteer in the civil service, but I think I would definitely say that I was in a minority within the Foreign Office. I went to a meeting and at it, a civil servant said, we know the British people got it wrong. And for me, that undermined everything about public service and about democracy, about self-determination. It's not for one civil servant to say that the British people got it wrong because they disagree with the outcome. The golden rule of the civil service is not to pick a side, but it was being stretched. A clear but narrow majority of voters wanted out of the EU, defying the expectations held in the grand old buildings of Whitehall. But some of its powerful players were ready to defy convention too. On this occasion, this solitary occasion, I decided to tell my colleagues and therefore let ministers know that I had voted to remain in the European Union. Um, I felt that they would assume that in any case, so I decided to embrace it. Having covered politics for more than 20 years, though, it's extraordinary to hear you tell us that you told people how you voted. Because that principle of impartiality is what holds the civil service together. I was trying to maintain credibility and trying to convey a message to a group of people, most of whom I felt had voted to remain in the EU, that their personal feelings were beside the professional point. It was a personal decision. My board were not entirely comfortable. And all these years later, you can have a conversation about was it right, the right decision. Simon MacDonald, 
has told us on the record that he told his colleagues and ministers that he voted Remain. Wow. OK. That's, that's, that is genuinely surprising. Why? Um, why is it surprising? Because to be so explicit about what you personally, how you personally had voted, and I don't know why, I don't know why that would be a good or helpful thing. With Whitehall shaken, the Tory party was visibly starting to crack. I remember sitting in the back of the cab and, and the radio broke out. It's all happening down at Westminster, breaking news. And it said, breaking news, the Justice Secretary, Michael Gove, has just announced he is running for the leadership of the Conservative Party. Michael Gove is standing. Amazing reaction was, God, they've got that wrong. They've got it really wrong. But Michael Gove had betrayed his running mate, forcing Boris Johnson out of the leadership race. It was a genuinely shocking twist, and it changed British politics for years to come. I have concluded that person cannot be me. I really feel that what Michael Gove did actually changed the course of history of this country. There are many words I'd use to describe what he did. Words like betrayal, like deceitful. Although I didn't know that the result of Michael Gove's actions would be a Theresa May government, an utter chaos and stalemate and gridlock, I kind of sensed this is really bad. From the start, this meant leavers did not have the chance to deal with Brexit. In the scramble that followed, they lost control. Candidates fell fast one after the other, leaving only Theresa May. A Remainer, a reserved politician, Prime Minister by default, charged with calming a warring party and controlling a system in shock. This was a huge responsibility that she was taking on. A colleague had had the foresight to uh, buy a very big bunch of flowers for me to present to Theresa as well. I confess that I hadn't thought of uh, doing that. I am honoured and... She knew Brexiteers wouldn't trust her, so built a cabinet, half leave, half remain. In theory, a perfect balance, but in practice, disastrously divided from the start. Welcome everybody to the, the first cabinet meeting of this new, uh, new government. We won't be a government that's defined just by Brexit. We will also be a government defined by social reform. The May government was riven by this ideological difference about uh, whether Brexit was a good thing uh, or a bad thing. We'd end up with hours of interminable debates where, and Theresa May would go around and ask every single cabinet minister to speak. And, uh, and it meant these long, long meetings that didn't really come to a conclusion. Her favorite expression at the end of a meeting was, let me think about it. Cabinet ministers, even though they might disagree in private, collectively have to agree something. And I can totally understand why she had to have the balanced cabinet that she did. But in practice, it made governing almost impossible. With Cabinet, a flawed forum, Theresa May used a powerful pair of advisers to govern instead. One of the most uh, sort of uh, impactful decisions she made was she chose you to have two chiefs of staff, two people that were particularly close to her, Fiona Hill and Nick Timothy. Special advisers in general really exist to give advice, as the title suggests, but also to act as the kind of voice on earth for their principal. You absolutely need to have that trust between the principal and the advisor. And so she certainly really trusted in us. Where she wasn't so trusting was with her political colleagues. As Prime Minister, you will always be careful about who you trust you ought to be. It was just a very professional relationship. It wasn't a relationship where you know, we were friendly, but we weren't friends. It was always professional and slightly at something of a distance and a reserve. It's obviously a good thing to bring trusted people with you, but two people isn't really enough. 
if you're the Prime Minister, you need to hear a good debate amongst people who have very different views from you and from each other. A million miles from David Cameron's government of chums, they were fierce protectors of Theresa May. Always alert to threat, always conscious. She had no mandate of her own. They sought to conquer, not cajole. There were two very powerful Joint Chiefs of Staff who were disliked by many people across Whitehall. You've previously called them a poisonous set of advisers. Why do you say that? It was the effect they had on the system that Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill were feared by the system, even though very few parts of the system had any contact at all with them because they were in the ivory tower of number 10. They liked to project this sort of uh, reign of terror that it was their way or no way. There's a culture clash where you as somebody who works to a democratic timetable with you know, maximum terms of five years, you have, you have time limits on what you can do and how quickly you can do it. Uh, and you have a sense of urgency that is sometimes lacking in the system. And the civil service tends to work in this uh, slightly strange way with euphemistic language, which is sometimes caricatured in TV series. Uh, and there's a, there's a culture clash between the politicos and the civil servants, sometimes. But the bigger clash was inside the Tory party. With only a tiny majority, Theresa May didn't have the authority to impose agreement. The solution? A secret. The pair kept it from the cabinet and the country. And at the start, from her. I remember being in the Rose Garden having a private conversation with Nick and sitting on a bench thinking, but how does it now look in the cold light of day? And it was quite cold because it was <laughs> December. I do remember a conversation in, in the Rose Garden over the winter season. Fee used to go out there for a cigarette, so I used to dutifully follow her. We talked through the reality of the situation and the fact that we thought that an election was going to be necessary. At this point, we didn't mention it to Theresa at all. Nick and I kept it as a two-man conversation. She only had a small majority in Parliament. Now, if you've got an ambitious policy and you really need the freedom and the power to negotiate, well, then you need to line that up with your political support, and that meant getting a bigger majority in Parliament. I get a phone call to go and see the Prime Minister. There'd been a lot of chatter. You'd had Philip Hammond, David Davis pushing very hard for an early election. But we always had the view that elections were always uh, dangerous. Of course, any election can be dangerous. And I remember before Cabinet, she had a series of one-to-ones uh, with, uh, with figures like Boris Johnson, who at that point was Foreign Secretary. It was a surprise to some people around the Cabinet table because not all of them had had uh, those advanced conversations. The response from Cabinet uh, when she told them was uh, one of universal uh, praise and agreement. I sat around the Cabinet table Announcing an election when you haven't really worked out what you think your manifesto is going to be wasn't at all a smart decision. I have just chaired a meeting of the Cabinet where we agreed that the government should call a general election. This was a big surprise. Um, my director of communications came in and told me the news. I remember being quite surprised given that uh, we'd said uh, on a number of occasions that there wasn't going to be a general election. I remember having these conversations. We're riding the crest of a wave. We can actually do pretty much whatever we want. We just need to put it into the manifesto. The logic of the election was to get the votes needed to manage Brexit. But May's team could not resist the bigger opportunity to try and change the country in all sorts of other ways. I oversaw the policy work, so with the Downing Street Policy Unit and working with different ministers and advisers from across government, we produced the manifesto. The manifesto was decided almost entirely by her core team, especially her two chiefs of staff. The cabinet were not included in, in any meaningful way in putting together that manifesto. The election had been a secret, what it was trying to achieve had been closely guarded too. 
Some of the most powerful people in the country had hardly any idea what they'd be standing for. I'll never forget, we were in the bus going to Halifax with this bus full of cabinet ministers. And Boris saying, has anyone seen this effing manifesto? One of the people around Theresa May came and gave us each a copy, and she said to us, um, go down, sit in the front row, and don't look like you've never read it before. I launch my manifesto for Britain's future. I was handed a copy of the manifesto. I ripped open the envelope. I flipped to my area. I saw this social care policy. I read in about five seconds, I worked out it was going to be a total, utter disaster. I'd never seen it before. I went over to, to Philip Hammond, said, what's this? He said, you know, I said, I won't tell you exactly what he said, because it won't be good for TV. We will forge a new, deep and special... We actually had a very good economic story to tell, um, but we didn't tell that story. You know, it led to some really catastrophic mistakes. The population is ageing. How to pay... For Tough, increasing perhaps sensible plans to fix the country's stubborn problems, because Theresa May wanted to get things done. But mistake number one her plan to shape how we care for the elderly and vulnerable. Get you rid of your nurses! I have been a nurse for 27 years! My regret with the manifesto was on social care, it was the fact that actually we did get it wrong. I mean, you know, it did worry people. And then actually, I think it is true, you know, the party then struggled to communicate it, and certainly our politicians reported a, a negative reaction on the doorstep. <laughs> about the, um, yes. the Prime Minister had to budge, but it was awkward, embarrassing, and she showed her nerves. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Theresa May you know, tried her best. I think she had a very poor team around her, so made some very poor choices. Theresa wanted that policy in her manifesto. She was adamant that she was having that policy in her manifesto. And she then had to defend that decision for the rest of the campaign, really. The enthusiasm of the first two weeks had disappeared and it was a much harder grind out there. The momentum had all shifted to Jeremy Corbyn. The whole atmosphere of that campaign can be only summed up with one word, and that is cold and grim. That was two words. I don't know if you're accounting. <laughs> I remember a moment in the campaign where Fee said, oh God, you know, we're Remain, we're Hillary Clinton. This is, the, this is a campaign that's not going right. Really, it needed to be a quick election on give Theresa May the majority to deal with Brexit. And so I think it was right to have an election but um, unfortunately, it was, then, um, it was then fought on the wrong timetable and in the wrong way. And what we're saying is the Conservatives are the largest party. Note, they don't have an overall majority. At 10 p.m. on polling day, so I just finished locking up, calling all supporters, trying to get them to come out and vote. And as soon as I'd heard the exit poll, I knew I'd lost. From there on in, everything felt like it was on fire and there was no control. It felt like the sky was coming in. Linton Crosby was sort of swearing and saying it's wrong, it's effing wrong. And Stephen Gilbert was a campaign specialist who worked for the party, took me to one side and he just said, exit polls are never wrong. The whole thing is just days. I don't really remember leaving central office. Anything stable? about what's happened? It was obvious within hours Nick and Fee must go. Um, there's no, you know, either you go or they go. And she very quickly um, chucked them under the bus, of course. She told me that I had to resign, and I resigned, and that was the end. Although it wasn't really the end, because then I spent quite a long time being thrown under the bus and having my reputation completely and utterly ruined um, without any support from either the party or the government. But that's politics. Politics is a very rough business. I'd written the manifesto, and I think it is true that we were blamed more broadly, uh, and, and we did suffer uh, you know, quite seriously afterwards. But in the end, 
if you're in these positions, you have to take responsibility. The Prime Minister had lost her top team, her majority and much of her authority. She needed help. The Prime Minister came on the phone and initially I, I still didn't really believe that I was going to be offered this job, so I thought she was probably just phoning to apologise for what had happened in the election and that's how she started. And then she sort of said, anyway, I'm in a bit of a hole and I wonder if you'd come and help and, and try and dig me out of it. The election had given Theresa May's rivals inside her own party more power and taken hers away. Looking back, we can say, of course, everything started with Brexit, but I think that general election, which uh, lots of people thought the Tories would win easily, I think that set the, the tone for the next, uh, the next few years. A minority government passing through some of the most controversial, difficult, fundamental constitutional legislation that we've had in 100 years was always bound to hit severe problems. What difference did it make to how you were operating in Whitehall when Theresa May lost the majority? The reason why she had called the election was to marginalise the awkward squad in her parliamentary party, and suddenly that awkward squad was even more powerful. So uh, what had been difficult became even more difficult. Yet Theresa May's determination to hang on saw her through for a while, with a fierce desire to find agreement on Brexit, or at least to try. In secret with officials and a select few ministers, she landed on a plan to present to the cabinet at Chequers. The UK would leave the EU, but would still share many of the bloc's rules. Even before ministers sat down, her plans were under attack for sticking too closely to Brussels. Would the cabinet even last the day at the country retreat? It was an absolutely lovely summer's day. And this contrast between the blue skies, the gorgeous countryside, these wonderful gardens, and this really difficult debate that was taking place uh, in the house couldn't have been greater. Tension was very high, anticipation was very high. The media narrative was that we're camped outside Chequers, long lenses at the ready, waiting to see who leaves first. That was the narrative. And, and of course, it didn't happen that way. From miles away, we could spot some of the most important political conversations in a generation. But no one flounced out. Not yet. I can remember the dinner where Boris Johnson stood up unprompted and uh, led a toast to the Prime Minister and saying, you have given us a song to sing. Nobody broke ranks during the day. And then, of course, overnight, it all fell apart. Hello. So what happened? Oh, really? The so far the only people tonight who are answering their friends are former Remainers. Eventually, at midnight, a call told me that David Davis, the Brexit secretary, would quit when morning broke. Within the past few minutes, the Brexit secretary, David Davis, has resigned from the government. I didn't know that David would go. But of course, it left us as a department in the lurch because we'd, we'd lost our political leadership. My job as a permanent secretary is to keep the morale of the department high. So I thought I'd better go and talk to my team. And I find myself standing literally on a soapbox in this big room with hundreds of my team around me, thinking, do you know what? I haven't got a clue what's going on. It was almost like Hamlet without the prince because everybody knew, David Davis having gone, that the, uh, the most interesting person in town was Boris Johnson. What would he do? I got a message from Number 10 saying, Prime Minister needs you back in Number 10 straight away. She was on the phone to Boris. She'd been on the phone to him for about 20 minutes. But in the end, she sort of said, look, Boris, I have got other meetings. Are you <laughs> resigning or are you not resigning? Um, so she almost had to kind of provoke him into making the decision. <laughs> I was camped outside Boris Johnson's residence when the decision came through. He's gone. <gasps> he's gone, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. The last few minutes, after warnings from friends in the last half hour or so that he might quit, Downing Street has um, actually confirmed that he has. 
On the day he chose to resign, he had spent a weekend agonizing over the deal that was on offer. It was very clear, though, it wasn't possible. It was another journey point, I felt, of the Leave campaigners stepping up their campaigning. After Chequers, it became absolutely evident that they were working with uh, various, you know, paid campaign groups to actually declare against the Chequers deal. You know, Chuck Chequers, they called it. The direction of radicalising MPs against any deal that Theresa May could do became really clear after Chequers. Make no mistake, this was a plot to get rid of the Chequers deal and ultimately to get rid of Theresa May. I spent the subsequent weekend in my roof uh, study in front of my big screens in my shorts and flip-flops and T-shirt absolutely waging war on the government. Um, Twitter, WhatsApp, talking to colleagues, procuring resignations, planting stories with journalists, amplifying tweets by sending them around networks of MPs, absolutely whipping the media cycle and the newspapers into a frenzy. The achievement of Chequers was to have put together a Brexit deal at all. That was no mean feat. But it meant Theresa May could no longer hide behind her vague mantra of Brexit means Brexit. She had chosen, picked a deal that was too close to the EU for many MPs who'd wanted to leave. So from that moment on, they had cause to agitate and they had a potential leader. Looking back now, you can see that's when both sides started to harden their attitude and a new radical ugliness began to emerge. Were there people that were deliberately trying to sabotage her, do you think? Of, oh, yeah, of course there were, yeah. It is undoubtedly the case that in the course of my political career, I have been a systematic blotter who's tried to remove the Prime Minister and eventually succeeded. And that doesn't give me any great pleasure, but it's too... be too bashful to pretend otherwise. I remember reading one newspaper story where a Conservative backbencher said, the knife is being warmed up and it will be plunged in the front. And for... What kind of person who's an elected politician says that about anybody, let alone somebody that is the leader of their own party? And I think that speaks to the kind of poison that was injected into our politics by this issue. Did she feel it? I'm sure she must have. Any human being would wonder how people that you regard as colleagues could be speaking about you in those terms. There was a lot of personal uh, attacks going on, people being undermined anonymously or not so anonymously, the civil service got swept up in that. That was an inevitable consequence of this deep, deep ideological rift uh, in the heart of the party which was translated into the heart of the government. Every day my phone buzzed with almost unbelievable quotes from Conservatives about other Conservatives privately vicious, sometimes cruel, even publicly, like nothing I'd ever seen before. I remember one occasion when we were doing an interview and you said some of your colleagues were traitors. I don't remember saying that, actually, and I'm rather ashamed that I did use the T word. Why do you think people did use that kind of language? I suppose where my good temper got high, and if I use the T word, and which I regret, um, and feel slightly ashamed of, then um, it will be because you just, you just get to the point, you just cannot understand why anyone would disagree that people's vote needs to be able to count for something. It felt like a political war. No deal, no agreement, anger everywhere. MPs couldn't agree inside, the two camps boiled over outside. We looked on, trying to understand it felt alien, sometimes unsafe. Parliament looked like the crazy place, and the television pictures made it look like Westminster was sort of a place of civil war. Yeah. One of the difficulties that we had throughout the whole process was you were almost kind of fighting a war on two fronts. If you'd had Parliament united behind you, you'd have been in a much stronger negotiating position with the EU. And if the EU had been supportive of someone like Chequers, you might then have been able to sell it to Parliament. But we were actually stuck in this horror show of simultaneously trying to convince two parties, neither of whom was completely convinced by what we were trying to do.
I definitely felt that sometimes Parliament was kind of wild, really. I mean, it, it really did feel like sort of fever dream, and you'd actually be in the building, and it had like a really extraordinary atmosphere and energy during that period. In a moment, in a moment, I will take interventions. What are you playing at? What are you doing? You are not children in the playground. You are legislators. I don't regret it. If, 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 I mean, you know, I, I was trying to inject into the House a sense that we needed to take responsibility for this really complicated problem. But I was also becoming by then increasingly troubled by the real prospect that Brexit would be lost completely. There were lots of people uh, within the Conservative Party that didn't want to, to see Brexit happen, and they voted it consistently against the government. And it was a very difficult time uh, for the whips. Uh, I was briefly a, a minister in the department uh, for exiting the EU. We never knew from one day to the next whether we could win a vote or not. Well, good morning, everybody. I remember being in number nine at Downing Street, which was the office of the chief whip. Um, you know, Saturdays, Sundays, the whip's office was working you know, all hours, uh, trying to, you know, hold the party together, trying to find uh, resolutions. It was relentless. I think if it was possible to cancel all social engagement and anything uh, other than complete focus on this task, I'd appreciate it. What was the impact on you? Well, I lost all, mo most of my hair. I, uh, I, uh, I find it in, 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 very stressful just in terms of not result. I'm used to kind of resolving issues. Parliament felt completely paralysed. I mean, so many different versions of Brexit deals had gone to Parliament and Parliament was rejecting everything, every version. There was no agreement at all. It was so negative that it was changing me as a person. I'm a very positive, constructive person and I like to work on and for things and getting things done and, and it was really this version of politics that is the antithesis of me. Many MPs, particularly women, felt the same. Being screamed at, feeling fear was not unusual. Panic alarms, security became part of the tools of the trade. I think if you're in a system, which is how Brexit Westminster felt for three and a bit years, where you achieve absolutely nothing but just go through the same emotions and votes and conversations and abuse over and over and over again. I don't think it's any surprise that many women decided, actually, you know, the House of Commons is not for me anymore. I remember saying to my staff once, all this talk about death threats, I, I don't get any. And they said to me, um, we have, just haven't told you about them. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know a single MP who didn't get a death threat. Such is the hatred of me that has been spread by daily newspapers, by some broadcasters. I can't even travel on public transport and probably never will be able to again. And people accuse me of being toxic by arguing we should be independent. I don't think so. I don't know what a revolution in a democracy would look like but it probably looks quite a lot like this. The middle ground does clear out, it did clear out. And from my perspective, you did have to make some choices about which side you were going to be on. There was no middle ground. It was binary. And the extremes at both sides came here to face off. Remainer rage and Brexit frustration boiling over. This didn't look or feel like Britain. I do remember a couple of days thinking, I don't recognise this. What is this going on here? Do you remember how you felt about some of those really intense moments? The challenge with Brexit was that the tone of the debate was so unpleasant and negative. You know, referenda tend to embolden and empower the extremes of debate, whereas parliamentary democracy brings you together because ultimately it's at the balance between the, the two sides that you come to a conclusion. 
This is what referendums do. They drive a very deep wedge into the political psyche of the country. And it's very, very hard to recover from that. Um, we saw that in Scotland. Because I'd been so involved in that campaign, I sort of knew what was coming. And it's not been pretty. Theresa May could not drive Parliament to a decision. She did not have the power to make it happen. I think colleagues became more and more frustrated uh, that uh, it wasn't clear how we were going to move forward in any way. Political power is so ephemeral, it just dissipates, and it was clear that power was, uh, was dissipating. The Conservatives were so violently divided, the Prime Minister took a last gasp by looking to the other side. It was a sign of Theresa May's desperation that she reached out to the opposition parties because, frankly, her own party was absolutely impossible to deal with. But it was far too late. She was always in a difficult position because she was a Remainer, albeit a very quiet one, who had become the leader of a rabidly Eurosceptic um, anti-EU membership party. I think that the compromise was almost impossible. There wasn't a version of Brexit that was going to be leaving enough. We'd have to leave everything else or tow the country to somewhere else. It just wasn't, it was just an insatiable, it felt like an insatiable demand. Talks between Labour and the Tories stuttered along for a while. Looking back though, it was just too late. Things were so stuck that all sorts of ideas were on the table, leaving the EU without a deal hated in Remainer quarters, asking the public to vote again in another referendum, despised by Brexiteers. But Parliament was failing. There was even talk of another PM. I do remember a weekend when it was suggested to me that actually Theresa May would go, David Liddington would become the Prime Minister, there would be a second referendum and this deal would all happen. How much of that is true and I what do you remember? I don't, I, I, it's not a conversation I've ever had with David, um, but it was definitely something that some people were talking about as a sort of potential way through. How does it feel to you that, you know, there were conversations about a national government where you would have become Prime Minister, done a deal with the Labour Party? I think some people who were on the Brexit side of the argument might think that there were plots going on and actually, frankly, that that would have been an outrage. Yes, yeah, so that was, that, that was what, what happened, I think, at the end of the day. That the trees was not going to go. I mean, that, that was very clear. And I certainly made, never, never made any suggestion to her or made any move against her. I would not have done so. But there weren't conspiracies. What there were were the increasingly desperate searches for ways in which to break the deadlock with a deal. One by one, the doors closed on Theresa May. I think the country had a good sense that we were in a real crisis in government. The only way out was for her to go, leaving behind a broken parliament, a battered party, and no Brexit. So when it came then to the day, it was obvious that she wasn't going to go on. You were, of course, one of the people who had to take her through that decision. And I think it was just you and her then at the end. Yeah. Can you just tell us what that was like? It's, I mean, it's obviously a very, I mean, I felt like I'd let her down because, um, I mean, there's not, there's not a job description to, to being chief of staff, but if you were going to write one, what paragraph 1.0 is keep the prime minister in number 10. Um, so it was a, it was a very painful moment, but she made it, very easy for me because she said, I've, sort of, I've come, I've talked to Philip and I've come to the same conclusion. I do so with no ill will, with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. I kind of ran in through number 11 to catch up. She was waiting for me outside the cabinet room and she sort of straight away apologised for getting emotional. And it's the one time when I lost my temper with her a little bit. And I sort of said, what, you know, why are you apologising for showing some emotion? I, I, like, for two years, I've said to you, show more of yourself to people. And then she just said, OK, yeah, but you wait and see. The newspapers will use those images differently because I'm a woman. And she was right, actually, in terms of how the images were then 
portrayed, I think. Was Theresa May a good Prime Minister? No. Sadly. She wasn't a, not a good Prime Minister, it's an utter catastrophic disaster. Yes, she was. And I think if it hadn't been for the Brexit negotiation, she would have continued to be a good Prime Minister. Probably my favourite bit of working with Theresa May was right at the end when she just went and did all of the things on her list. She really meant it about injustice and particularly what she could do for women and people who didn't have a voice. She's a really very, very, very impressive person to work for and somebody who inhabited the office of Prime Minister kind of totally. Theresa May's a good person, but it, it's hard to say she was a good Prime Minister because of the great difficulties that arose over Brexit and the 2017 election. The Conservative Party is historically the party of stability, um, sound government, proper management, etc. To be honest, I think uh, the chaos uh, of 2017 and 2018 had already significantly undermined um, our reputation. Strong and stable, more like messy and miserable. Conservatives reckon their reputation might be shot. Yet, inside government, civil servants were preparing to do it all again. It's a very weird experience, those days of PM changeover. She's saying goodbye and thank you. If you're me and the Cabinet Secretary, and you're all thinking, sort of brace, brace, ready for what's coming next. Looking back, perhaps it was always going to have to be Boris Johnson. Political karma. The Brexit's biggest cheerleader would have to clear up the mess or make the most of the opportunity, depending which camp you asked. We must now respect that decision. But his approach would be totally different. Divide and rule. Now. The method, perhaps the madness, drive anyone who disagreed into the ground. This is the start of a new and very different era. Boris Johnson and the Brexiteers are now in charge. But maybe they're not so much taking back control in inheriting a precarious and fragile position. The Prime Minister's chief plotter and sidekick, Dominic Cummings, for whom provocation was how to get things done. The way that Boris Johnson ran number 10 was different from any Prime Minister in my professional life. He brought in the most powerful chief of staff the United Kingdom has ever seen. Until that point, prime ministers and their staff have been in basic sympathy with the system. They've all wanted to change it in some way, but nobody else has wanted to break it first. They switched the team, promised to leave the EU at Halloween, whatever the cost. But they had to unstick the same problem Theresa May had, gridlock in Parliament. Dark whispers about closing the Commons down, proroguing or shutting Parliament, were denied, but then swirled and then denied again. Would they dare? You had lunch with Dominic Cummings the day before prorogation. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Where were you and what did he say to you? Yeah, we were in the cafe and downstairs in, in, in Downing Street. Boris and, and Dominic Cummings as his sort of henchman on Brexit, um, they knew that I was against prorogation. I asked him, are you going to prorogue Parliament? And he said no. At midnight, a cabinet minister called me in outrage to say Jacob Rees-Mogg, one of the privy councillors, was heading to see the Queen the next morning. Proroguing Parliament, keeping the Commons closed for weeks to prevent MPs checking or stopping Boris Johnson's Brexit. It really was the secret plan, despite those weeks of denial. I actually got a text from Philip Hammond that morning saying, have you heard the Cabinet's about to be bounced into proroguing Parliament? I didn't think anybody would go that far. I literally remember taking a gulp of breath because you, you, you sense this is 
This is so we haven't seen before. Boris Johnson was the new Prime Minister and he had every right to prorogue Parliament to, in order to set his agenda and his own terms. The authority to shut Parliament for an extra five weeks rested with the Queen on the advice of the Prime Minister. This is normally routine. But when Number 10 admitted what was going on before nine that morning, it was plain. This time, it was anything but. I was still on holiday, uh, trying to verify that that was actually true. And it is. So here we go. The cabinet was assembled by telephone. And uh, immediately prior to that meeting, the prime minister telephoned me um, on my mobile phone and said to me in terms, please don't spook the cabinet with talking about mitigation risk. Though I should give my legal opinion, um, I shouldn't dwell too largely upon the risks. It was a ploy to deny MPs time to block Boris Johnson's plan to leave the EU without a deal. And the Queen was being asked to approve it. I turned up at Heathrow, and by the time we got to the desk to get onto the flight, uh, we bumped into the former Black Rod, who immediately realised that three Privy Councillors on a flight to Aberdeen must be up to something. Then suddenly we get the call uh, that we're having a cabinet call, and it's on Twitter that Jacob Rees-Mogg has been spotted in Scotland. I was walking through Aberdeen Airport, listening to the cabinet meeting on the one hand, I think I had to say something, um, whilst uh, a father and son were doing a selfie with me on the other. It was all rather odd uh, way of carrying out public business. After ministers had been expressly told Parliament would not be closed down, some of the Cabinet were stunned. I couldn't believe it when I heard the news of prorogation. Because, you know, in, in politics, people very rarely say things to you that are directly untrue. Essentially, you're telling us that Dominic Cummings lied to you. Yes, it was something I didn't forget. While the Queen was on holiday at Balmoral, another rule was broken. Do not involve the monarch in a bitter political mess. The list of things you must not do is cause a problem. Cause a problem for the palace is number one. Like, absolutely number one, you don't do that. I think that was the first time I really properly understood that there, there wasn't a limit at all to what they would do in order to make sure that the UK left the EU as soon as possible. And Downing Street was well aware shutting Parliament would push the Conservative Party to the limit, even causing trouble with the Prime Minister's own brother. Joe Johnson called me up and said, how bad do you think this is? And I said, we are like the frog being boiled. We are settling for something, and each time it's slightly more. It's very bad. And he said, yeah, I agree. An hour later, he resigned. And I thought, he moved quickly. Um, so then I had already planned on resigning as well, and I resigned that weekend. And it's been an honour to be MP for Orkington and a minister under three governments. But it's time to move on and I've got to get to work. Smashing political convention was one thing. Crashing into the law, something else. Number 10 advisers had stewed over the plan for months. But the government's own chief lawyer with a seat in Cabinet, well, no one asked him. A sign of the level of secrecy and willful controversy over the idea. I'd had no opportunity to advise on the means of taking the decision, on the reasons why such a decision might lawfully be taken, um, on the likely outcome should the decision be challenged in the court. And thereafter, the rest is history. History that saw the highest court ruling on whether the government had broken the law by closing down the Commons. So we're waiting for the judgment of the Supreme Court. <gasps> here we go, here we go, here we go. That the decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament was unlawful. That's absolutely amazing. So it's basically... She said it was unlawful, never so it never happened. It's like it didn't happen. <laughs> Someone just texted me saying we have officially imploded as a nation. <laughs> Number 10, privately, had always known there was a chance the courts would say no. But some ministers were only too happy to attack the judges themselves. 
That judgment was deeply politicised. It was one of the worst uh, judgments that our courts have given in recent years. Baroness Hale simply did politicise the judiciary. Her behaviour was disgraceful. I remember sitting at the Labour Party conference in the cafe there, listening on my earpiece to Lady Hale deliver that judgment. And that showed the British Constitution working because check and balance, it's what distinguishes democracies from other countries where whoever is in government can do whatever they like. We tested our institutions nearly to destruction, but thank God we did actually get through that test of our constitution with it still working. Just about. Well, yeah, just about. We just about got through it. And I don't ever want to do it again. Take back Parliament! Yet the court's decision wouldn't stop Boris Johnson. Controversy was the oxygen of his number 10. Every time he was thwarted, he could claim more loudly that Brexit was being deliberately blocked. And every time, that meant he could argue more drastic action was required. Institutional memory was basically thrown overboard um, in the summer of 2019, and it all became tremendously fraught. I and 21 of my colleagues were summarily ejected from the party for the offence of failing to vote for the government on a three-line whip, an offence which the Prime Minister had committed many, many times during the course of the Ther Theresa May government. An incredible hypocrisy by Boris Johnson. Do you remember who called you? Uh, it was the Chief Whip. And what did they say? <clears throat> You're out. MPs with decades of experience, former chancellors like Ken Clark, and even Churchill's grandson. They were all kicked out when they didn't toe the line. The removal of the whip was a temporary expedient until Brexit was dealt with. I don't think it was seen as saying that Ken Clark was not a Conservative, for example. He was saying that he had uh, broken a serious piece of party discipline and therefore the whip was removed. It's absolutely extraordinary the way the journey became so radicalised. By the end of 2019, when Boris Johnson is Prime Minister, it becomes unacceptable to oppose a no-deal Brexit. It became illegitimate as a, to be a Conservative and to be against no deal. Now, if you told people that in 2016, either Leavers or Remainers, they wouldn't have believed you. Against Boris Johnson's wishes, Parliament did pass a law to stop the UK leaving the EU without a deal. But Dominic Cummings' response inside number 10, breaking the law, bring it on. It became a bit undignified between me and Dom with me saying, well, you can't break the law, and him saying, well, we can. He was so determined, because of the strategic advantage, to just say, if the Prime Minister has to be taken away in handcuffs on the streets of Downing Street because we've broken the law to, to leave the EU on time, which is what the country wants, then I'm not bothered by that. But that's an extraordinary scene that you just paint a picture of. The Chief of Staff is arguing, you can break the law, that's OK, for political reason. You're arguing that it's probably best if the government doesn't break the law. Yeah. It was, it was surreal. Everybody was out of lane and not playing reasonably. It just escalated really, really quickly. Next time, control and chaos under Dominic Cummings. At best, it was like having two prime ministers. I think that what I did was actually reasonable. As Boris Johnson's Downing Street implodes. Sounds like maybe not a revolution but a revolution within the system. It was different from anything that went before.